Welcome to Iron Arts. My name is John Hasegawa. Today, we're meeting with Paul Aho, Dean and Photography Instructor at the Paducah School of Art. And we're going to talk about some photographs and photographic techniques. Hello, Paul. Hey, John. How are you doing? Um, everything is good. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Yeah, so um, let's talk a bit about photography and different ways to approach the art of making photographs. Yes. Right? So we know that, I think everybody knows that the biggest revolution that took place in photography in the past 15 years or so has been that of the digital imaging, digital image making, and digital cameras. Yeah. And we all know that you can take your photographs to places and they can print them for you, or we can go into the realm of what is known as the digital darkroom, and we can use these amazingly beautiful devices, these exquisite printers that Epson and Canon and others produce for artists, photographers to make uh, stunningly beautiful color or black and white prints. Mm -hmm. right? But we also know that there are a lot of people out there who are working in alternative modes. And I think that our audiences are probably less familiar with um, that sort of approach to image making as opposed to what we call capture. So we have digital capture and we have digital output as different sides of the same coin. But there are people out there, largely many of them are academics, people who are teaching in our university systems and such, but there are artists out there who are working with processes uh, that are known as historical or alternative, or a lot of artists and photographers who are working with hybrids between different types of technology. Mm -hmm. So they're employing digital image making techniques or the technology or the software or the computers as um, some sort of nexus to other processes or they're using them to link between or uh, support work in these other fields. Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about some of the uh, different ways that a variety of artists um, who are friends of Paducah School of Art have been in an exhibition here uh, recently um, used to produce these works of art in mm -hmm. their own sort of realm and sort of the hows and whys of what um, artists choose to work in these sort of archaic practices. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Yeah. So where would you like to start? That's a good question. I think yeah. we should start kind of at, well, I mean not quite at the beginning, but close mm -hmm. to the beginning. Uh, what most of us are familiar with in terms of traditional photography before the digital era was something called film photography and film capture, right? So we know that artists traditionally either used black and white film of one sort or another, and or they used, with the advent of uh, color film, they began to use color photography as an artistic expression. So guys like Joel Meyerowitz mm -hmm. uh, was an early street photographer who made the transition to color film, and a number of other artists sort of braved that in the late 60s and early 70s and such. But um, traditionally artists, have though, Black and white photography has been sort of the art form of choice for most artist photographers mm -hmm. because of that sense of that more distant remove from reality. So mm -hmm. it represents an abstraction off the top, mm -hmm. right? So you're converting a visible world of color to an abstracted world of black and white shapes and, and, and the, we read them differently. Mm -hmm. so, but the drawbacks with uh, what are traditionally known as silver gelatin prints, this is a process where a piece of paper is coated with um, the silver salts and by exposing them to light and processing them in a certain type of chemistry, we convert those silver salts to metallic silver. They turn dark mm -hmm. through this processing, and um, we get a corresponding relationship of lights and darks in the photograph according to how much light struck the photograph. So we traditionally had a film negative, and the film positive would be a reversal mm -hmm. of that image. So the clear areas on the negative would allow more light to pass through, and that area would become darker on the photograph. Oh, okay. A couple of things are problematic about silver gelatin prints is that, that the silver salts are suspended in a gelatin, right? So okay. um, unlike what we're going to look at next, which are with platinum or palladium prints, the, the image is sort of suspended in something that isn't integral to the paper. So it changes the physical properties, the, the sort of aesthetic properties of that photograph as an object. Mm -hmm. And photographers think about their photographs as objects. And oh. in the internet era, you know, there's a lot of photography out there that never sees um, real daylight, right? Yeah. It exists simply in the cyber world and people share and show their photographs online and we know there's dozens and dozens of ways for people to do that. But artist photographers think about art, uh, photographs as physical objects, okay? okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, the other thing that's problematic about silver prints is that they are not particularly stable. They, they turn yellow with age, the silver um, tarnishes, 
and it's not generally something that's done on what artists really consider as archival supports. Oh. So the paper isn't really um, the equivalent of 100% rag paper that printmakers or people who work in some of these alternative processes would choose mm. as the support for their photographs. So in order to um, account for that, and so, uh, well, prior to that really, prior to this dilemma, if we go back further in time, we go back to people like uh, William Henry Fox Talbot, who invented something called the salt print, right? And then we had things that uh, we had a group of um, scientists, photographers in, in Britain. A lot of this uh, sort of early technology and early development of photography came out of England, surprisingly. Um, so there was a lot of innovation going on there. And they invented something called the platinum and or platinum palladium prints. Okay. So instead of using silver salts or metallic silver as the out they would use other metallic compounds. And the, the, the beauty of them is that they are enormously stable. They can be created on archival support, so they can be done on the sort of traditional rag papers that artists, printmakers use, as opposed mm -hmm. to photographic papers, and that there isn't any suspension of that light-sensitive material in a gelatin film, so that the colorant, the physical quality of the, the image, is more integral to the surface of the paper. Mm -hmm. And they also don't um, have the tendency to curl, and they don't discolor. So there are some, um, other than the uh, aesthetic reasons for using them, there are some uh, profound mechanical and sort of physical reasons that artists would choose to make them. So is that a pretty traditional process? Would we see lot, are lots of artists using that process? Um, very few do, okay. but a surprisingly large number do. Mm -hmm. It's just that they're sort of more in the background. You know, there are people who have their sort of practices, and they're generally people who have moved through um, traditional film processes in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them still shoot film, and if you were shooting film, this would be uh, um, one of your choices. As we'll see a little bit further on here, we have artists who shoot film negatives, scan those negatives, and then use mm -hmm. them in the digital darkroom rather than a traditional wet darkroom okay. in order to, to either simplify the process or to have the advantage of being able to more, um, with a higher fidelity, manipulate those images and control their images. Okay, so they, they do the capture with the on film. Generally so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And generally there are people who are still working on um, either four by five or eight by 10 film, because oh. much of this work is done as a contact print. Okay. So instead of projecting an image like you would with a 35 millimeter negative, you're using a much larger image capture. So, you know, you can put like, what, 20, 35 millimeter um, exposures into a 4 by 5 film, right? Oh, okay. So the fidelity, the, the quality of that image, what we call image quality, is inherently much, much greater through this process. Oh. And the amount of detail um, that we can get through this larger um, film capture, um, it's what put Ansel Adams and Minor White and others on the map, right? Oh, yeah. But there are photographers who are doing 35 millimeter negatives and who are then uh, digitally making larger 8x10 um, negatives on like clear film and then using that, it's called pictorico or pictorico film, where they basically create their own oversized negative for contact printing. Oh. So they take that small negative and they tr somehow transfer the image onto <coughs> a bigger negative. They make it onto a bigger negative and then they coat the paper with this light sensitive platinum compound, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's a lot of science involved in this, of mm -hmm. course, in terms of step value charts and uh, like uh, wave graphs and that sort of thing. The things that people are really into, um, this becomes as much, it's as much a science as it is an art. Because right? photography always has, since it's kind of modern, a modern art form, seems always kind of technology driven. In um, a lot of ways. Yeah, a, a, lot of, a lot of bright minds been at play mm -hmm. here for a long while. So, um, so I again, th we take that negative, we turn it so it's emulsion to emulsion, basically put it into a vacuum frame or some sort of device that sort of presses those two surfaces together succinctly and simply expose it to light and then process it um, in the different sort of chemistry and a different process as silver prints, but much the same way to remove areas of the image that have not been exposed to light because light serves as um, a hardening 
I won't say it is the hardening agent, but it activates the chemistry in such a fashion that the areas that receive light become hardened mm -hmm. and will not uh, remain in place once that photograph finishes its process. So these are still black and white prints? That were they are generally, they're either yeah. um, variations on black and white. They're toned mm -hmm. largely. Okay. Okay. So they have these beautiful selenium or uh, sepia or different tones, and you can adjust the color by the ratio of um, the amount of chemistry. And um, there's another compound that's at play. It's called ferric oxate, I believe, is mm -hmm. and it's sort of an accelerant, but it also affects the coloration of um, the final produced print. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like just taking the photograph is just really the beginning of a pretty long process. Yeah, right. So uh, again, we're just going to quickly look at a few things. The first mm -hmm. things that we're going to look at are these images by Don uh, Budendostel, who mm -hmm. is a photographer out of Nashville. Uh, Don is an artist who uses traditional uh, film capture, makes scans from those negatives, and then prints his prints in an archival inkjet process, much like um, we talked about earlier in terms of Epson printers and that sort of thing. Also, like something similar to what you would have sitting on your desk at home, like that kind of inkjet printer? I mean, um, uh, kind of a close cousin, but mm -hmm. um, like one of those printers on steroids, right? <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, they're really high fidelity. Okay. And the printing process itself is you know, I mean, I kind of laugh about it with my students and say, well, it's uh, only a, a page long. And so we have the opportunities to, like, to make decisions about how the, pr the computer, the image, and the printer um, communicate with one mm -hmm. another. And it's a very sort of exacting science. So every paper and every printer has what's known as an ICC profile. Mm -hmm. So we make adjustments with those profiles according to the type of paper. So that accounts for how white or off-white the paper sheet is, how thick it is, how absorbent it is, whether it's a matte paper, a gloss paper, and all these things. But we can see with Mr. Budendostel's images that we have the ability to create what look like very traditional uh, black and white silver prints with a very beautiful tonal range, mm. right? So um, his photographs are taken in the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia and um, Eastern Kentucky. He's uh, spent enough time with these people that he has a level of comfort and trust with them, and he's um, able to document what's largely sort of a hidden and uh, certainly soon to disappear culture. Mm -hmm. And the next artist we would look at would be, um, again, we're going to talk about these platinum prints that we would just, oh, I'm sorry, the next artist we're going to look at is Larry Schwarm. And he's a professor at um, the University of Emporia State. Emporia University. State, right. <laughs> in, in, uh, former where John Hasegawa yeah, taught. And I, I worked I, with him. You two were friends and colleagues at one point mm -hmm. in time. And I just talk about Larry's work quickly in that this is sort of a signature image that he's been doing for decades of uh, prairie fires. And we talk about it simply because it's a traditional C print. What we simply call a C print is simply a color print of yesteryear, mm -hmm. right? But um, Larry's been doing these photographs for um, almost 20 years now and has made a considerable um, reputation for himself and really put himself on a big map mm -hmm. in terms of um, sort of chasing the opportunity to document these prairie fires. So a C print is not an inkjet? It print? is not. It's a traditional color photograph. And it, it unlike the technologies we use today, um, color film and color print film is a composite of three different layers of gelatin, right? Or mm -hmm. some sort of um, vehicle that carries what are known as dye couplers. And each of those, so there's um, a cyan, magenta, or a yellow, a coupler for each um, layer of this photograph so it registers the wavelengths of light. So it splits these things out and creates a composite photograph by transposing three layers on top of one another mm. in one single piece of information. And we'll see that a little bit later when we look at Christina Anderson's uh, what are known as tricolor bichromate photographs, oh. where she employs the same technology but in a more painterly fashion. Okay. okay. So if we look at um, Mr. Overture, this is uh, Daniel Overture, and um, he's a photographer out of uh, SIU in Carbondale, and he shoots film, and he makes a beautiful platinum prints from the things that he documents. So we can see that he's, um, by appearances, he's a rather traditional photographer. The <coughs> prints look traditional. They're uh, beautifully toned, sort of uh, black and white prints. But his eye for composition and the thing that he chooses to photograph, I think, are really exquisite. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Extraordinary. And uh, again, I think that he's, um, he, you know, these are contact prints from full-size negatives. So the size of the print that you see, if it's a 5 by 7 inch photograph, it's done by a 5 by 7 inch negative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he just wants to capture all that detail, yeah. the fine grain. Yeah. 
Okay, and we mentioned Christina Anderson, who is also an academic, and she's made a, a, re a reputation for herself by refining this practice that's known as <coughs> gum printing or gum bichromate printing. And she does this with three different colors of, um, well, it's not really ink, it's like watercolor. So these are mm -hmm. like photographic watercolors. So if we look at this closely <coughs> and you look around the edges, you'll see that you can see actually they're like brush strokes. And the brush strokes are in um, yellow, blue, or a magenta. So each of these, of her photographs are done in three separate exposures from contact prints by painting on a layer of blue, painting on a layer of yellow, and a layer of magenta in three different steps, exposing that contact print, washing out the unexposed areas, mm -hmm. drying the piece of paper, and putting that the next negative in place and making an exposure for the following color. So there are composites of yellow, blue, and magenta pigments mm -hmm. that are really watercolor pigments that she has suspended in gum arabic, which is the binder for watercolor um, paints as well. So then she brushes this very, very thin articulate film onto a sheet of um, fine art paper and makes these separate exposures and creates these sort of um, stunning uh, hybrids between painting, the process of painting, and photograph as sort of the brush, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then um, we have other artists like uh, Deborah uh, Ford, whose work we see here, which is um, a hybrid as well in that what we are looking at is a black and white photograph that's been scanned and then a digital image transposed on top of that photographic information. So mm -hmm. these are composites of another sort, right? So we've got a set of um, sort of just, there's a scan of a, a, a map and a scan from a photograph of a landscape. And her work um, w is about, the subject of her work is about land use and uh, sort of land abuse around the world so that she goes to places and she photographs these terrains that are under sort of duress from industry or mining or whatever and then transposes maps, um, sc sort of scans of maps of these locations on top of them into these sort of um, stunningly beautiful images that um, sort of have um, a, a subtext, a very mm -hmm. significant subtext in terms of you know, how we interact with our environment and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are artists like Rod Falls, who is the University Gallery Director at Florida Atlantic in Boca Raton, who in um, his case uses a multitude of small digital captures from just like point and shoot cameras, sort of randomly shot you know, without much particular attention to framing and to the sequencing and such, and then combines them into this sort of collage montage driven by this grid system. And we see that we're really beginning to bridge um, the gap between photography and a sort of contemporary approach to image making that resembles in large measure um, the work of uh, painters that I find of interest, mm -hmm. right? So we can see in this, um, what this looks like, a blue field. It's actually called uh, Blue Moon, September 2012, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a photograph of a sequence of moonshots sort of composited together. And, you know, just the sort of, uh, it's this sort of um, random I Ching thing that John Cale um, made, excuse me, John Cage made sort of famous in the 60s and 70s and 80s, where, you know, this is a sort of order of things was sort of incidental on th that just by combining random things you begin to generate a different sort of mm -hmm. magic. Mm -hmm. So he's focusing more on d using that digital darkroom to compose his images and, and perhaps not as focused on the how he's printing it. Uh, well the prints are very important to him oh, but okay. the photographic process itself, the framing of the photograph mm -hmm. and that is sort of um, really kind of arbitrary. Mm -hmm. um, if you're riding around with him, you almost got to be ducking back <laughs> in the car window because he's sticking a camera up and taking a photograph out the window on your side, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, he's in the driver's seat and, you know, <laughs> you know that sort of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, and then let's talk a little bit about more traditional uh, digital work. And we're looking at some things by myself um, in a form that's, um, I do a lot of what is known either as uh, diptych or triptych photography. Mm -hmm. And that's this sort of the conjoining, like what we just saw with Mr. Fowles' work is that there's a conjoining of images to create a sort of um, a coherent whole, mm -hmm. right? A, a unity and variety, that sort of thing. 
but in my work, what I do is generally take two or three different images, and either for formal purposes, mm -hmm. either just for um, the visual relationship of one passage to another, or some photographers employ it for um, to generate content, like readable narrative, and some of it is just you know sort of the poetics of the the beauty of the physical world and how mm -hmm. we can create relationships between things. Anytime we put one thing next to another, we create a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So um, a lot of what I do is in that realm, but these are traditional um, digital prints done from um, large scale Epson printers that we have at the art school. So we have the capacity at the Paducah School of Art to create, um, you know, either traditionally sized photographs with this archival inkjet process or very large scale photographs upwards to 44 inches wide and as much as 100 feet long, yeah. right? right? The technology is amazing. But furthermore, the technology has gotten so good with these inks. So these are what are known as ultrachrome inks that Epson uses at this point. And there are like 11 uh, cartridges in this large printer. And they, they're archival because they're light fast up to either 100 or 200 years. So they're mm. actually more permanent than a traditional C print or color photograph as of yesteryear, where we always had problems with reds being very fugitive and mm. um, you know a high problem with fading yeah, in color you photographs. You see that in your old photo albums. You do see that in your old photo And those are things that are largely, for the most part, kept in the dark yeah. and not things that are hanging on your wall where the morning sun passes over them. You know in the morning. Yeah, this is mm -hmm. amazing. You print at home, but still have something that's even better than what you used to get. Pretty yeah, amazing. It's, yeah, it's really remarkable and um, remarkably affordable, mm -hmm. you know, even by the standards of creating an, um, a dark room. And you don't have to have a dark room. You don't yeah. have to go through that problem of trying to isolate, you know, or <laughs> take it over your bathroom, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, so the next I'd like to talk just a bit to carry on from that is this notion of um, because I'm a painter in large measure, you know, photographs and paintings, um, a practice that I've taken to and something a lot of artists are uh, doing as well is um, manipulating these photographs in a physical fashion by painting over them after they have um, physical presence as a thing on paper, right? Okay. So I've been working recently on a new uh, body of work where I'm taking photographs on paper, mounting them to wooden panels, and then I'm painting on them much in the fashion that I would um, in as the sort of finishing surfaces on what I do um, in the studio as a painter. So I'm disrupting, as we can see in the photograph of the cypress trees, so we take that sort of straight photograph and mm -hmm. then come back and begin to um, overpaint them with a series of um, oil and acrylic applications that begin to convert them from something that reads as a straight photograph to something that reads mm, photographically but also pictorially as um, painting as an object, as a painting. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to look at a couple of examples of that where I'm, I'm either pouring paint or pulling paint or using clear films and breaking up the surface of that and mm -hmm. then filling that broken surface with transparent colorants and sort of so you can read the photograph but begin to read it as something that um, you know, begins to approach a different realm as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's just because of my training as a painter or if um, I'm just restless in that <laughs> regard or, or what, but it's something that's engaging me at the moment. And mm -hmm. you know, and those um, who are familiar with my work, I think, can see the relationship between these. And, and you know, even on occasion to break the photographic mm -hmm. image, uh, um, it, I might even turn the photograph on its ear. So yeah. it's sideways and you can read it, but it reads more like a painted work yeah. than a photographic work. Definitely, it looks yeah. more like a painting. Yeah, looks more like a painting, mm -hmm. and doesn't have the landscape associations, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, I, again, you know, it's just a matter of taking a different approach to different images, and just like making paintings, okay, what's right for this particular image? Mm -hmm. So it isn't this sort of mechanical, sort of patent um, application of a technique, but a sort of a responsive act and react sort of sensibility that a painter would bring to um, realizing a finished work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, I think we talk about the work of um, a Miami-based artist whose name is Pablo Soria, somebody mm -hmm. that I've known for a very long while and who works in a variety of realms as well. But what we're looking at here with Pablo's work is, um, again, it's sort of a, an inverse of the painterly application that I was just describing from my work in that he takes a photographic image and physically suspends it in front of a painted surface. So the backgrounds on these photographs are actually acrylic paintings. 
So that blue passage behind the bridge is um, a painted blue field. And the image, the photographic image, is um, an image that's been projected on and processed onto a clear piece of film called Litex. And it's very, very similar to the graphic arts films of yesteryear where um, we would have you know, the ability to, to purchase sheets of film that serve the graphic arts industry, mm -hmm. something called orthochromatic film or high contrast film that was used to produce line arts. If you process that in Dectol as opposed to a high contrast developer back in the day when we mm -hmm. did such things in dark rooms, um, you would be able to produce um, a reasonably uh, continuous tone photograph rather than the black and white stark line art application that the film was engineered for. So mm -hmm. what he's done is he's found a material that will produce this sort of beautiful tonal um, aspect, and he's processed them in a, a fashion where they take on these sort of um, archaic look, right? This mm -hmm. sort of toned black and white work that's consistent with the painterly aspects of their backgrounds mm -hmm. and such. Yeah, they look ancient. Yeah, they look ancient. They look and like and, when and they have this, ago. in their real physical presence, they have this um, sort of illusionistic aspect as well. They almost seem like three-dimensional because, in fact, this film is slightly suspended in front mm -hmm. of this other surface. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Those are just awesome photographs. Yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased that um, the response I've had from them in the community yeah. where we showed them here. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Paul. This has been great uh, learning about all these different techniques today. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's been fun talking about them. Yeah. yeah. And that's um, a wild world of science and art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, John. Thank you.